Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Ashley Tellis, a senior fellow at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. And it is my pleasure today to host this conversation on the transformations that are underway in America's international economic policy. I think the topic of the conversation and its importance uh, is self-evident. The impact of international trade was a central issue in the 2016 US presidential campaign. And the decisions that have been made by both the Trump administration and the Biden administration in turn have had a major effect both on how the United States relates to the world and how the international community views the US commitment to upholding the global trade regime. The US withdrawal from the Trans-Pacific Partnership, the decision to avoid pursuing new trade agreements involving market access, the return to industrial policy through the Inflation Reduction Act and the Chips and Science Act, and more recently, the reversal of long-standing US positions on e-commerce and cross-border data flows, among other things, have led many to believe that America's foreign economic policy has changed dramatically. How US international economic policy is changing and what its consequences are, are the subject of this conversation this afternoon. And I'm delighted that I'm joined by three wonderful scholars to discuss these issues. My guests today, and you have already seen their extended biography of the invitation, are Jason Furman, who is the Aetna Professor of the Practice of Economic Policy at the Kennedy School and in the Department of Economics at Harvard. As you all know, he was previously Chairman of the Council of Economic Advisors under President Barack Obama. We also have Mary Lovely, who is the Anthony Solomon Senior Fellow at the Peterson Institute for Economic, for International Economics, our neighbor here in Washington, DC. She's also a Emerita Professor of Economics at the Syracuse University's Maxwell School. And finally, we have one of our own, uh, Tino Cuellar, who is the President of the Carnegie Endowment of International Peace and a former justice of the Supreme Court of California. So we have an excellent team uh, that is primed to discuss the issues that I just flagged a few minutes ago uh, in my introduction. So why don't we jump straight into it, uh, if we may. And I thought it might be useful, Mary, if I called in you first, uh, to just give us an overview of where we stand today with respect to the evolution of the global trade system, uh, going back the last few years so that we can contextualize the conversation that follows. Mary. Great, thank you, Ashley. And it's, it's really a pleasure to be here with the Carnegie Endowment. Um, you mentioned that American foreign policy is fundamentally changing. Um, if we're lucky, it's evolving. If we're not lucky, it's simply changing. Um, and flip-flopping from one direction to another. So we're still in the midst of this ongoing evolution, if we're lucky. I think we can trace some of the most important changes back to the Obama years, um, and in particular, a uh, growing sort of China fatigue, uh, a, a growing fatigue um, and, la and end of patience that the U.S. had with certain Chinese practices, and a growing understanding in civil society that uh, Chinese practices were having um, effects on the U.S. economy that were not welcome. So while the U.S. welcomes uh, the need to adjust for long-term shifts in comparative advantage, or at least recognizes that need, if not welcomes, uh, there was the belief that the um, types of disruptions that the U.S. economy was experiencing were the result of unfair trade practices, uh, technology theft, et cetera, a whole litany of complaints against China, which persist to this day. Um, when Trump was elected president, it followed an election in which trade and the disruptive effects of trade uh, played an important role, as you mentioned, Ashley. And he came in with a very transactional approach to uh, economic affairs. 
Um, we saw the rupture with China, his decision to rather uh, quickly uh, escalate a uh, trade war that took about a year and a half and ended with tariffs, which we have to this day of about 19% on our imports from China. And they maintain uh, tariffs of a, a close to 20% on mostly agricultural goods from the United States. In keeping with Trump's transactional approach, he and his um, U.S. trade rep, Robert Lighthizer, did negotiate a phase one agreement, uh, which contained some promises from the Chinese for further liberalization and reform, but really contained, most importantly, a, a set of purchase promises from the Chinese um, that were to be made within a particular period of time. Those purchases were never made. Um, part of it was the intervening uh, arrival of the pandemic, but many at the time thought that they were simply not ever going to be uh, achieved because of their ambition. Um, so phase one, I would call it not the phase one deal, the phase one bust. Um, there was also the trade uh, transactionalism extended to the European Union and to parts of Asia. So among other things, President Trump launched section, what are called Section 232 tariffs with a national security rationale uh, to protect steel and aluminum. And this was levied on partners like the EU, European countries, Japan, um, and other key allies of the United States. Um, we continue to have trade restrictions in steel and aluminum, and they continue to be an irritant to our relationship with those countries. President Biden took office in the middle of the pandemic, and people were very upset about the lack of personal protective equipment in the United States. So the pandemic and the need to diversify our supply chains became job number one. And early in his term, in fact, in January of his first year in office, he issued an executive order calling for um, reviews of supply chains in a variety of critical sectors, including semiconductors. Um, there was also growing concern about tech competition from China. And here I'm separating it from the national security concern. We know that if we have a coming technological revolution, the AI revolution, there's enormous asset destruction, but also asset creation. And the U.S. wants to play a leading role in setting the standards and the terms for that competition. And of course, to have our own players playing on a level playing field. Third, national security concerns, growing concern about the ability of technology to lead to repression, misinformation, and spying, which has led to a set of reactions from the US, uh, along with many of its allies. And lastly, um, the desire of the Biden coalition to address, finally, climate change in the US, all of which they began to target through what I'll call his efforts to rebuild um, American supply chains, build resilient supply chains. It's been a major theme of his foreign economic policy. Very quickly, three main tools, reshoring tools. So here we see the emergence of industrial policy, which I'm sure we'll get into in our conversation. Secondly, friend shoring or an attempt to create supply chains that embed high labor, environmental and other standards inside of them. Uh, third, de-risking, but which frankly, despite the fact that we have adopted the European Union's nice term of de-risking, really is a decoupling strategy with China. And here we have most prominently the export controls that have been used on semiconductor, semiconductor manufacturing, semiconductor manufacturing software to Chinese suppliers. So those are the main tools that have been used in my view. Uh, a Separate from these economic tools is, of course, a renewed emphasis on diplomacy and um, coordination with our allies. We can see that, for example, in the case of Europe, in the formation of the Trade and Technology Council, more deep consultation. Um, and of course, we've seen that have uh, important benefits when Russia invaded Ukraine and the world came, a large part of the world came together to issue sanctions on Russia. Let me just finish by saying there are some real constraints on any president on what he can do. One is just reality. China is deeply integrated with almost every economy in the world, certainly those that are key suppliers to the US. Um, 
our work here at Peterson has shown that over the last 15 years, these relationships have deepened dramatically. And so any president will be pushing against those long-term economic uh, trends. Lastly, it's just geopolitical uh, concerns. The allies or friends that we're courting uh, do not want to choose, will not choose between the United States and China. Uh, let's look simply at Vietnam, where a lot of our, uh, as we moved away from China as supplier, we've turned to countries like Vietnam, clearly playing a dual strategy of staying close to China and to the United States. We can see it also in Mexico, very close to the United States, U.S. largest trading partner, and yet Mexico is uh, receiving lots of investment from China. Last, just let me say that any policy like this has enormous distributional consequences that also limit the president's ability. President Trump was able, I think, to convince a large segment of the U.S. population that tariffs are not paid for by America, they're paid for by Chinese. We have just reams of evidence now with millions of data points that that is simply not true. There are Americans who are hurt and some who gain from tariffs, as we have always known. There's also enormous distributional concerns across the globe. There are partners that are pushing back, important allies that see the U.S. Uh, turn toward industrial policy, protectionism, and moving away from the promise of non-discrimination that is embedded in the WTO to target China as going in the wrong direction. And it puts enormous space between us and some of our key allies. I'll leave it there. Thanks, Thanks Mary. Mary. That was a fab fabulous overview. Many, many issues obviously brought to the fore. I want to explore two or three of them in succession. Uh, it seems to me that what you've outlined is the enormous shift that has taken place in terms of the state's willingness to now enter the broader trading regime, not leave decisions about trade to be determined by markets and private actors alone. And that seems to be a theme that ties both the Trump administration and the Biden administration together. Um, Jason, I was wondering if you could reflect on first the differences between the two administrations with respect to state intervention. What has been the distinguishing mark of the two interventions and two, whether this is now the new future of global trade, that we are going to see much greater state intervention, whether it is for national security reasons, whether it is for domestic reasons and so on and so forth. Great. Well, thanks for um, including me in this discussion. Look, I think in the Trump administration, they had one goal which was economic growth and they would then pursue it with means that i would argue in many cases weren't um advancing that goal but regardless that was the stated goal um in this administration it's more a plurality of goals it's economic growth but it's also climate change it's also national security it's also um resilience and that's one big difference uh, mary talked about this from the trump administration the overarching goal of trade policy with China was to get them to buy more stuff. And once you do that, you are locked into a bilateral approach. If our goal is to get China to buy more Boeing jets or soybeans, we're not going to get Japan and Germany to come together with us to China to say, hey, China, you should buy more stuff from the United States. Um, that's a solely bilateral thing. Once you're about these broader goals, national security, now, not only can we, but we must um, work together with, say, the Netherlands, which is a critical part of the supply chain um, for microchips. Um, we must work with others um, around climate change. And so that's one of the big changes is the broadening out of goals in terms of what we're trying to achieve. And I think that broader set of goals has brought some greater degree of multilateralism. Now, there are still some tensions between the rhetoric around trade, which I think in this administration is, is vastly better, at least to my taste, um, than the previous administration, where, for example, trade limitations on China, this administration, phrases around high yard, I'm sorry, 
<laughs> a small yard I fence, um, which is basically saying we're just going to do it for national security reasons. We're not going to pretend that we're going to enrich Americans by making washing machines from China more expensive. We are not going to make pretend that that's how to make American families safer, uh, richer. Um, and by the way, we don't worry about washing machines from the perspective of national security. So we're going to focus on things like microchips um, and the like. The um, you know, so I think the the rhetoric is vastly preferable. Um, I think the problem is that all most of the previous policies are still there. And so even though rhetorically this administration is not committed to raising prices on consumers in things that have nothing to do with national security, in practice, they've left an awful lot of that in place. And I get it's harder to take something away than to add it, but uh, it doesn't mean that I don't think it's a problem. And then the other thing I'd say is this administration, because it has multiple goals, I think the other problem they've had sometimes is talking about trade-offs between those goals. Um, the National Security Advisor likes to talk about uh, you know, foreign policy for the middle class, that everything we're doing is about the middle class. That's actually not true. Some of what we're doing vis-a-vis -vis China um, and, and microchips, I think, isn't helping the American middle class. Um, it's telling the American middle class, you're going to have to pay a little bit more in order for greater resilience, in order to advance our national security, in order to help Taiwan and reduce pressure on Taiwan or you know, for whatever else it is. So once you have these goals, climate, national security, et cetera, um, you do at some point need to start adjudicating between them. And if you pretend that all of them always go together, um, that can put you in a place where you're not thinking quite as hard about what some of the downsides and trade-offs are. Both uh, Jason and Mary flagged the importance of China as one of the drivers of the changes in uh, US economic policy in recent times. I'm wondering if there is a complementary factor, uh, and that is US domestic politics, and how the impact on China has affected different uh, social classes, different sectors within uh, the US economy. Uh, Tino, I was wondering if you could sort of speak to that question. I mean, what is what is the domestic base of support uh, for this shift, however subtle it is, in terms of our traditional approach to trade? Thank you, Ashley. And let me extend my appreciation to Dr. Lovely and to uh, Dr. Furman for being part of this conversation. We have some real economic rock stars here, and then there's me, as it were. Um, but, but actually, I want to take your question with a historical lens that goes back to when I started my career, actually. Well before I ever served on the bench, I worked at the Treasury Department. Bob Rubin was the secretary. Larry Summers was the deputy secretary. Uh, a lot of the issues I worked on had to do with illicit economic activity, anti-money laundering efforts. Uh, there were economic sanctions issues, issues around corruption and smuggling. And uh, what was really striking to, to me then is that there was a consensus, fair to say, uh, between moderates from different parties, from different value systems, but that it converged around the view of what the trajectory of the international economy should be and the role of the U.S. in that economy that transcended, you know, the, the administrations and uh, re was reflected in the commitment of Treasury back then, for example, to support, broadly speaking, lower tariff barriers, more economic integration, more foreign direct investment, more capital flows. So one thing that has not changed, I think, is that our subject really is not only trade. There are a bunch of issues that are adjacent to trade that are important. There's illicit activity, capital flows in the domestic, in the illicit economy, there's foreign direct investment, there's immigration, uh, certain domestic policies that all shape the outlook of the international economy. But some things have changed quite a bit. Let's take China, that's where you started. Between 1980 and 2010, to a first approximation, the Chinese economy grew by 10% a year on average. Think about what that means for an economy the size of China. That is a staggering fact, not only of what that means for hundreds of millions of people who are living a somewhat better life in China, although there are challenges there, obviously, but also for what China means in the international system and what the geopolitical pressures, and to your point now to get to your question, what the domestic concerns began to be about a country that perhaps at one point seemed to be on a trajectory 
such that it would likely converge to some degree with certain values, certain institutional realities, certain goals the U.S. might have, but increasingly showed itself to be economically more advanced and developed than it was, and yet not in alignment with the U.S. on all kinds of things. Some economic with respect to the renminbi, some mm -hmm. with respect to the South China Sea and Taiwan, and some with respect to like what is a good form of government. And with respect to our own form of government, certainly uh, just as China was becoming more and more economically prominent in the world, more powerful, because there's always a connection between economic power and all kinds of other power. It was also true that for reasons that were broader, uh, economic prosperity in the U.S. began to increasingly concentrate itself in a few very dynamic metro areas. The how and the why of that is very interesting to me, and I think it has relevance to our broader global mission at Carnegie. But let's just say that sitting in California, one of the real beneficiaries, at least for some parts of the state, of that dynamism and the tech economy and international trade, it was not lost on many of us that many, many other parts of the U.S. were increasingly not feeling that uh, prosperity and also feeling other fault lines, cultural fault lines and whatnot. So that gives me to sort of where that domestic piece then raises some hard problems, because I think it's fair to say we're living through a powerful realignment where that degree of consensus among, let's say, moderates around a certain degree of global economic integration has fractured. And you then have to go and find different coalitions and see how can we imagine an international economy where the U.S. still plays an important and dynamic role, can offer some market access, but also takes account of a set of political realities domestically where there's a lot less support for a global economic outlook like what we had before, and internationally, where countries like not only China, but India, Indonesia, Kenya, Nigeria, South Africa, uh, are not so happy necessarily and looking for different ways to have voice in that discussion. So it, uh, I take the point that there has to be a certain degree of remedial action uh, that the administration, any administration has to take if we are to maintain the consensus behind a broadly open trade regime. Because if you have a large segment of losers, obviously it is hard to sustain a consensus that we should have open trade. The question I have is one, whether we found the right tools to do it, especially the tools that we've seen used uh, in the Biden years. Uh, both Mary and Jason flagged the issue of trade-offs. Uh, let's, let's come to the question of trade-offs, but I want to know whether in your judgments, Mary and Jason and Tino, whether the tools we've settled upon are really, the, are really the tools that will deliver with respect to this remedial agenda for both economic and political reasons. Mary, if I could give you the floor for a second. Sure, I'm happy to discuss this. such a fascinating uh, question. So first of all, I think we need more than remedial. We need transformative because we're not going back to where we were. We have a different labor force, different sets of skills, different age profile. We have the need to green the economy. We have AI coming in. So it's really, we're not remediating as much as trying to create a, a new uh, labor force, a new role for labor in the United States that is healthier and more inclusive. And, and the Biden administration, I think, has, has um, been very uh, enthusiastic and descriptive about what we're trying to create. Unfortunately, I think the tools that are being used are just simply inadequate. Uh, they are basically increases in assistance to certain sectors, which we may need on national security grounds, such as semiconductors, uh, but are really um, not enough to create this transform transformation in the U.S. economy. The emphasis has been on trade in China. We have the bad guys. The bad guys have been lined up and they're up against the wall. The problem is that they came along with a lot of other quote unquote bad guys. Um, and there was good and bad that came with those. Let me just take who the other bad guys are. There was an enormous fragmentation of the production process, especially in electronics, but in other sectors that account for a lot of what happened with the so-called China shock. I like to call the China shock the fragmentation shock. China was there, yes, the fragmentation shock, shock, shock 
sorry, I'm from Rhode Island. That's a hard word for me. Uh, happened faster and probably was more severe than it would have been if China wasn't in the world economy. But we were already offshoring things to, to East Asia. So the other view is that trade doesn't benefit Americans. I've been at many public forums where I've heard that say, trade with China. In fact, our U.S. trade rep, Catherine Tai, has had to correct herself and say, well, yes, there was some gains, but it was in these few areas. There was enormous wealth created for Americans with China's entry into the global economy. Someone should check their uh, retirement accounts and see what happened to your Apple stock. Um, so what the problem was is that those benefits were not widely shared. People don't see those as benefiting them. And part of the problem is we have failed to tax multinationals. We have failed to uh, get some of those gains and share them with the American population. And when we push back, when we try to get some kind of globally uh, negotiated tax, we get pushback within the domestic political economy. But I think that more sharing and using those funds to create a better situation for American workers is absolutely key. Um, we're coming up to renegotiation of the Trump era tax cuts. We're going to see a lot of push to continue the, the tax cuts that were achieved. Uh, President Trump is arguing that he can use all that tariff revenue from his new 10 percent tariffs on everybody, 50 percent more on China, which, by the way, are part of his you know, platforms such as he has one. Um, and we're going to see an enormously regressive tax on American households to pay for tax cuts for American corporations. So I think the tools are woefully inadequate to the challenges we have ahead of us. Jason, do you agree with that bottom line conclusion? Yeah, I agree with that bottom line conclusion. But look, the administration doesn't control things. It needs to get things through Congress. They had an enormously ambitious initial set of proposals called Build Back Better, and it had two halves. Um, what was called the American Jobs Plan, which was about stuff, and the American Families Plan, which was about people. They passed a lot of that first part, and they passed basically none of that second part. Um, no paid leave, no expanded child care, um, no permanent changes in terms of health care, et cetera. And that's not for lack of intention. Um, that's a Congress that was unwilling to pass that. Um, so they passed the American Jobs Plan. Um, the other problem, though, is that the American Jobs Plan itself is, mis, uh, is mislabeled. Um, we, by subsidizing the sectors we're subsidizing, we're getting a lot more activity in those sectors. But interest rates have also been driven up, and that means less activity in other sectors, and prices have been driven up, and that crowds out. So what we've seen is a set of policies that I think are quite good, but they're not on net expanding total investment, but they're shifting investment away from, say, residential construction and towards um, green stuff, microchips, and um, the like. Now, we still have a quite low unemployment rate. And um, you know we could we could talk about the macro macro side of it, but um, we have that unemployment rate with real wages that for a while there were taking a very serious blow. They're growing again, um, but we're we're not back on trend in terms of what overall real wages would have been if you were in a normal situation. And so um, they've just been very constrained, and um, they've the part of their agenda that probably is most relevant to your question was the people part of the agenda, the American Families Plan. And you know, I don't see what the prospect of doing any of that is in um, the near term absent a very big shift in, in November. So Tina, where does this leave us? If we've made the enormous leap of getting the government involved now in a conscious economic policy, but the economic policies are not adequate to purpose, are we likely to lose both in terms of what we need to do domestically to sort of create that consensus, as well as lose the international community uh, because we are thinking of constrained trade as being the new norm? Uh, do we end up getting the worst of both worlds? Ashley, when a situation is impossible to maintain exactly as it is, it does change. And uh, it does feel to me like if I put together what uh, Jason and Mary are saying with some of my own ideas, I would note we're not in a perfect place. There are, there are a lot of things that are difficult to reconcile, but 
is it possible to see a path forward from a policy perspective? Of course. So I'll sketch it out, but then I'll note that it's difficult, right? So I think part of what you're hearing from all of us is that it is hard to tell a story about the success of the American economy that doesn't run through international economic cooperation for at least two reasons. One is it benefits American consumers and companies to some degree, done right. Two is it actually is uh, goes hand in glove with American strategic interests. If the U.S. is going to be a player in the future of a partner in the future of Southeast Asia with the key countries in the region, it's going to probably have to come to some degree of arrangement around market access, for example. That said, um, there has been a real um, backlash to the global role that the U.S. played inside the country that has played out over more than a generation. And does that partly involve a failure to bring along more regions, more backgrounds, uh, more kinds of people in the country? Of course. So I think from that perspective, I would note we can argue about exactly how the big public investments that the U.S. has recently made around chips and science, bipartisan infrastructure, IRA, COVID recovery are being targeted. We can argue about how what the pacing of those investments should be relative to inflation concerns. But one key idea that should not get lost here is that those investments are not only about U.S. competitiveness in the aggregate. They're also about a regional rebalancing that, to my mind, is an important part of the puzzle here. And, and I think, you know, one key question going forward will be how much of that can be achieved without also having some of the downsides you get with, um, with industrial policy and public investment in an advanced industrialized country that is not carefully targeted. And here I'll just note the Buy American stuff, which has been alluded to a little bit, you know, runs into some of the challenges that Jason was laying out in terms of multiple goals. That may seem like a short-term win for American manufacturing, but does it help with the climate transition? I don't think so. Does it affect American consumers in a very positive way? No. So I think part of what you're hearing from all of us is ideally American politics will provide enough of a space for us to be honest about the multiple goals at work here to try to reconcile them in a way that will be more sustainable uh, domestically in terms of just more more degree of political support for an engaged U.S. role, but within some parameters that don't create a backlash. Let me uh, draw two strands from what has been said so far. One is the regional balancing uh, that you just talked about, Tino. And I can see that obviously as an important American objective because we have geopolitical interests that go, that extend worldwide. But I was wondering if you all could reflect on what the implications of the United States pushing for regional rebalancing in the way that we've done. What implication that has for our allies, because they don't have the same equities necessarily in terms of regional rebalancing to be sure the Europeans now are revisiting their dependence on China as they revisited their dependence on Russia after Ukraine. But it seems to me that they're not quite in the same place. That is, they don't feel the same sense of urgency uh, or the same imperative uh, to do de-risking vis-a-vis China in a way that we do. So Mary, I was wondering, could you give us a sense of where the Europeans are on this question uh, or for that matter, where the major Asian trading partners like uh, Japan, South Korea and, and Taiwan are? Yes, I was just in, in, in both regions and found these types of discussions very illuminating. Um, if we start with Asia, the, our Asian allies are keenly aware of the security risks that we face with China. They are right, right on the front line. Um, but they also you know, live in the neighborhood, and so they want good relations. Um, and so they do try to, I think, moderate U.S. behavior. Um, so we will see, and as we move forward with uh, export controls, perhaps making that small yard a little bigger over time. Um, we're going to have to work closely with our allies who are key to uh, making those controls effective because, you know, they have important interests in China. Uh, they have important interests in maintaining peaceful commercial relations with China. Many of them are members of a regional comprehensive uh, partnership with China. So they have formal economic arrangements with China. In Europe, um, I was just there talking about this because, of course, the Americans are very keen on kind of 
waking up the Europeans to the danger. I think the Europeans are aware of the danger and probably nothing has had the impact of China's um, emerging friendship with, uh, with Russia. Uh, the Russia threat is, of course, palpable when you're in Europe, um, and China's stance on the Russian invasion of Ukraine is something that has certainly been very important in terms of turning the tide in, Russia, in European opinion on China. Having said that, they have a very deep commitment to non-discrimination and the rules of the WTO. Um, they see the value of competition, and they have uh, a system that is cumbersome, and slow outside of the central or EU competencies. So for example, on investment screening. So we will, for example, perhaps see the US and EU go a different way in terms of whether or not we will welcome investment from China, say in the EV assembly and manufacture. Um, so I think the Europeans are aware, they're increasingly wary of Chinese uh, behavior and influence, but they'll come down and apply their own values, which don't always accord one for one with U.S. point of view or U.S. priorities. So what is the implication of that for the success of our strategy uh, in terms of weaning some of the countries that China very much depends on uh, for its own economic and geopolitical goals? Jason? Oh, I just... I mean, part of the difference, and you said, you know, European countries being slow and behind or, or not moving as fast, is this is vastly different from Russia. Um, China's economy is much, much larger. Moreover, the stuff you get from China is much harder to replace. Um, natural gas, people thought it would be hard. You know, all natural gas smells about the same and burns about the same, and you just need to find it from a different place. Um, and this is just not um, not a goal. I mean, not not a feasible goal. Um, the delinkage, um, people can call it um, de-risking. I think it's worth trying to do what we can um, to de-risk. But the fact is, if you know, we wanted to put a complete embargo on China because they invaded Taiwan, um, we would do just enormous damage to ourselves, enormous damage to them, and. I don't, there's nothing over the next decade we could do um, that would change that number. Either we could change the magnitude, but you'd still describe it as enormous um, no matter what we did over the next decade. So I think we should be trying um, around the edges, especially on national security issues. Uh, the other tricky thing, and this gets you know further outside my lane, but some of the things you do um, might actually increase the national security problems. You know, You don't want to do something that says, oh, China will have less good technology in the event of a war, but the step itself raises the prospects of a war. And mm -hmm. so you're really multiplying those two probabilities, which is, you know, how do you reduce the chance of a conflict and conditional on a conflict? How do you make it less bad? And you don't want to make one of those halves better. You know, we're going to deny them, you know, advanced microchips in the event of a war. Oh, and now you just caused one because they want to accelerate. Um, and then the very, very last thing in all of this is, um, China is going to succeed in doing whatever it needs to do to replace whatever it is it's not getting from us. We can slow things down some. They're going to have missteps. They're not perfect. They mess stuff up. But the stuff they need to figure out, they will figure out. Ashley, I just want to add uh, two points of context here, which to my mind uh, fit nicely with what the others have said, but also reinforce the, the point I think you're hearing from all of us, which is pragmatism as a useful lens here. What, not only like what does the U.S. want to accomplish, but can we be honest about what goals are in tension with each other and what levers are actually going to succeed. I would add that what part of what's interesting about the China conversation that you've been pushing us to have, Ashley, is that if I go back to the Cold, to the, to the Cold War, but even really to the post-World War II period, the early history of like the GATS, didn't really play out as the WTO did because it was mostly geopolitical allies. Yeah. Countries that mostly saw eye to eye with respect to the role of the market economy, with respect to, you know, sort of alignment with the United States, sort of what the common defense meant. So the experience of building a global economy where there's a ton of interconnection between a country as different from the US as China, that has not only historical, you know, issues with respect to Europe and, and the US, but also a very different set of 
regional priorities, values, et cetera. And yet there's this degree of economic interdependence that is new. I think it's worth just pausing and recognizing that's a big deal. And how we navigate that, how we deal with the tech interdependence with, uh, you know, high walls and small fences piece with respect to sort of the double message we're trying to double message, the, the multiple communications we're trying to convey in a sense to China. On the one hand, no, we're not trying to sever completely economic relationships, but yes, we do have these concerns and divergences. That's really interesting and a real challenge for policymakers. The second point I just briefly wanted to make is with respect to U.S. international economic policy around sanctions, around extraterritorial application of U.S. criminal laws, around anti-money laundering, and all these other things that are right at the edge of the sort of licit and illicit economy, we just have to recognize the U.S. is bold in this area. Like, I would point out to the effort U.S. prosecutors and regulators made around Binance, where they imposed basically a $3.4 billion fine from FinCEN, a $1 billion settlement from OFAC. And that's, you know, in a sense, this reality that the geopolitical context is changing, getting more fragmented, less friendly to, in some sense to sort of European and American power. And yet there's still that ambition to say, we're setting these norms creates real uh, trade-offs for American policymakers. So let me ask you a question about, you know, the impact of our setting norms in one particular area. So for example, we've now taken seriously the whole question of industrial policy. And we have made the argument to ourselves that the rest of the world ought not to worry too much about it because we will stick to, you know, the small yard high fence approach. But what are the built-in safeguards that we have to ensure that, you know, the, the yard does not get larger and larger? So, for example, if you listen to Jake Sullivan, it's all about cutting-edge technologies. It's all about the frontier issues, right? And yet we see real dilemmas with respect to our treatment of Chinese electric vehicles. Uh, we see debates now about whether we should permit Japanese companies to merge or take over U.S. steel companies. I mean, at what point, so what kind of red lines do we draw for ourselves once we go down this course? And Tino, if you could just address this at the level of principles, because I know each case will be different and the equities will obviously vary depending on the you know issue by issue. But how, how should we think about this as we walk further down this road? I'll start by making two observations that feel fairly straightforward, but they're in some sense difficult to reconcile technically and politically. The first is that it has been an important geopolitical goal of the United States since before World War II to allow American companies and products and American innovation to reach different countries around the world and to let American consumers benefit from not only what we produce domestically, but what's produced abroad. There are good reasons for that to my mind. You know, you can argue about exactly how it should be executed, where there might be some room to vary from that basic theme. But that is not something that any one party or administration made up. It's, it's a through line, you know, and it runs through uh, Roosevelt's concern about anti-colonialism in the middle of World War II and his concern that that was really a way of limiting uh, how, how a global system might work. There are also good reasons, I would argue, although the, the, uh, the social science on this is complicated because causation runs in multiple directions, but I think it's a fairly compelling story to tell and one that has some grounding to say that when there is a tension to shared economic prosperity, there's a way of managing risk of war, it doesn't completely avoid the risk of war, but it's a tool to think about it in the world of statecraft when it comes to limiting war. So some degree of economic rules of the road and cooperation consistent with domestic goals is not only possible, but desirable. That was part of the project around setting up global trading rules, among other things. How to reconcile that then, technically and politically, with the realization that the domestic sphere is calling for more public investment and has led to a set of policies that forget China for a second, don't even make our allies in Europe that happy, right? And so then if you add 
the reality that we've got countries not only among emerging powers and developing uh, regions, but even among sort of middle income countries, asking also for more leeway to deal with different kinds of economic crises. You have a real challenge of rebuilding a set of norms, ideally from my perspective, not completely casting aside what's come before, but building in a bit more leeway and yet recognizing that just completely going to zero norms, you know, complete carte blanche and allowing protectionism, that really feels like not where we want to end up. So I think the challenge then is how to work with the Europe's of the world, but also the India's of the world and the Indonesia's of the world, eventually the China's of the world, around a tweaked system that is going to allow more leeway, but is still going to set some thin and fairly reliable parameters, not only around tech, but also around trading more generally and investment. So let me ask Jason and Mary before we go to the before we go to the questions on the floor. Can we pull this off? Can we craft a set of principles that will be first disciplined enough for ourselves and persuasive to the rest of the world that we are not really prepared to manipulate the system simply to advance our own parochial interests? Uh, you know, economically, I think it's quite easy. Politically, I think it's more difficult. We're not in a place where our allies are complaining that the bulk of the IRA was subsidizing green energy as opposed to the approach abroad, which is often taxing dirty energy. They're not complaining that we're subsidizing our semiconductor um, companies. In fact, we're subsidizing a set of global companies. The complaints are where we add superfluous, unnecessary, counterproductive things on top of it. Um, so the IRA's provision um, about domestic content for batteries has caused far, far more problem than anything else in the IRA. And um, that was, you know, consistent with what Tina said, what Mary's been saying, um, that, that's actually going to hurt our climate goals. Um, that's not going to help us economically. And so I, it's the buy American, the domestic content, the enforcing that against allies that is the real irritant, the subsidizing um, American companies, I think others have been pretty understanding of, and you know, that, that the subsidies are a necessary part of achieving the goal, at least given the constraints we have on things like a carbon tax. So economically, don't do stupid, unnecessary, superfluous stuff like buy American. Um, that'll let us do what we want domestically, do what we want with industrial policy, and keep international harmony. Um, politically, that's uh, possibly a harder thing to not to crack. But Mary, maybe, maybe you want to answer. Mary has the solution, no doubt. Well, I think, you know, we want to see the government intervene in some sectors and not others. And economists would say, well, that's that's perfectly fine, right? We can we can look at where there's a, 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 a good argument to be made that the social benefits exceed the private benefits. It's all nice on paper. I think it's very difficult in practice. Just as it's difficult in practice to say we're going to have free trade with China or we're going to decouple from China, trying to get the, you know, what is the right, what I call conscious uh, uncoupling uh, following Gwyneth Paltrow? What's the right way to consciously uncou uncouple with China? We can, well, I think many of us would agree that we need to do some of this for national security, for resilience issues, um, for our own domestic political economy. But uh, getting it right is, is really a, a problem. I think we do have a natural stopping point, which is that the Congress is unlikely to fund um, major industrial policies at the level that we've seen. It's quite extraordinary in the United States. Don't see another big one coming down the pike. I disagree a little bit with Jason, always a dangerous thing to do, but I think our allies were upset by the subsidies. I think they hear a giant sucking sound coming from the United States. When the United States pulls investment from other regions, they have to kind of scramble and figure out how they're going to keep their own new energy uh, companies as well. And lastly, I guess I'm worried about uh, not even creeping protectionism, but sort of running protectionism. So, what, or like the way I think of it is when government creates supply, who creates demand? So now we're going to have very expensive EVs that are going to have to be assembled uh, in North America. The batteries are going to have to be made in the United States. These are some of the objectionable, uh, you know, bells and whistles that Jason just mentioned. Uh, they're not going to be competitive with Chinese EVs. They may not even be competitive with European EVs, some of which will be made by Chinese transplants into the European economy. So 
we're gonna, we've already seen the, the UAW asking for higher uh, basic tariffs on um, vehicles. I will add, there is one possibility, which is not going to be fun, which is that if former President Trump is reelected and he comes in and puts a 50% tariff on China and a 10% tariff on our base, we are going to show the American public the value of, low, of uh, freer trade very, very quickly because it will be deeply destabilizing. So it's something I hope I don't have to live through. Um, but if we really want to show what the value of trade is, I think that would be an interesting, uh, not very natural experiment. So we have several questions on the floor and I'm also conscious of the time, but let me just piggyback off your last remarks, Mary. There's a question that has come to us, which says our trade relationship with China is, today is very different from what it was 10 years ago. Given all that we know, given all that we've discussed this afternoon, how do we imagine the trade relationship with China 10 years out? What will it look like? You're, you're supposed to tell us, Mary. I'm supposed to tell us. Yes, I believe he said that you were supposed to tell it's us. It's really up I'm, to us. I'm waiting in suspense. <laughs> to find out. The hard it's questions. really up to us. I think China has em embarked on an enormous indigenous technology. It's, it's really a bit contrary to where its economy is right now. Um, it is spending an awful lot of money, uh, uh, resources on its industrial policy. It may be moving toward spending an equal amount on food security. So what it will be trying to pump into the global economy is, is really kind of depending on them and what we'll be willing to accept depends on us. So I think that's a really, really hard question. I believe that we will have a modest amount or even a more than modest amount of decoupling simply because the technological advances and what's happening in China itself, which, are dis which is disturbing, uh, will require the US to take a step back on the level of integration that we have achieved so far. And can we can we take that step back in a rule bound fashion, or will that be pretty much ad hoc, depending on circumstances? The U.S. has already stepped back from non discrimination. It's clearly that that is not coming. Back, you know that is gone. Uh, whether we can find a way to have a dispute settlement procedure or uh, agreements among like minded countries through plurilateral somehow. Um, I think that there's more hope for that, that, that countries that want to pursue new rules, for example, on digital trade, we're already seeing it. It's, it's, it's happening organically in parts of Asia um, and uh, in other parts of the world. And I think we will see more of that. And in some sense, that's good. It's middle powers rising to saying we, we benefit from this system. We need a system. For example, the alternative dispute settlement mechanism, which has been used by a set of countries uh, to try to settle disputes with the WTO uh, right now um, not being functional in that area. So I think we will see some rules, new rules. Uh, got, you know, we certainly need new rules, particularly in digital trade, but in other areas. And um, I think we'll see sets of company, countries coming together, uh, not necessarily through FTAs, but perhaps through other types of agreements. Two other quick points, Ashley, and I want to make sure we have time for at least one more question, but uh, to building on Mary's point, it's hard for me to imagine a future over the next 10 years where the U.S. is not more concerned about securing its supply chains. So that, that will mean less trade with China in all likelihood. But let's be clear, even if China is economically uh, growing far less quickly over the next few years and so on, it's still a giant player in the global economy, the manufacturing hub of the world. So I think one way that also relates to these crucial middle power, middle income type countries like Vietnam, Mexico, is they will become these way stations even more where Chinese investment and technology and manufactured goods can come, be assembled, be transformed in some way, and then become sort of palatable or acceptable to economies like the U.S., as the, these trade divergences grow to some degree. My hope is that they won't grow so much that there really won't be uh, a complete wedge, because I do think countries benefit from a security perspective, managing their, their disagreements by having some relationship. But I do think it's just the reality that there will be less. Um, there'll, there'll be more of that sort of routing through third countries.
Uh, we have another question, which I want to sort of tweak somewhat. The question is, what can the Biden administration, how can the Biden administration leverage trade to achieve other foreign policy objectives, which is very broad. But I want to sort of tweak that to ask whether there is any room for the U.S. to play in selective trade expansion, even though the drift is against uh, trade agreements with market access and so on and so forth. Can we imagine some sort of workarounds, especially with our closest allies? And in particular, the whole you know, vexed issue of TPP and whether there is room if there is a second Biden term. If there's a Trump administration, of course, we know the answer to that. But if there is a second Biden term, whether there might be a case for revisiting at least some partial free trade agreements in our interest. Jason? I mean, there's the Indo-Pacific economic framework, IPEF, um, but it doesn't have tariffs. And when you don't have tariffs as part of it, it's hard to do very much with it. Um, you know, I think it's probably doing almost as much as it can, um, given the enormous constraint that that process placed on itself. Um, could it start to go somewhere more in a second term? Um, not that optimistic that it could, but um, but maybe it could. And, and I, there is a real recognition of that is a place where a lot of our national security interests and our economic interests are aligned. Um, this entire you know, conversation we've been having about China, it isn't more China or less China. If you want to have less China, you need, you need to have more of something else. It can't just be more of America. And there's a lot of countries in that region um, that the more of has, has to be a part. So I do think the economics and national security are aligned, but there's still just a, a sort of terror of a public perception around all of this that doesn't seem to be diminishing very quickly. And I think we'll still be there hanging over it. Um, in a second term, but there's a little seed of something that maybe you could hang your optimism on and, and IPEF would be the biggest seed I see in the world right now. So it seems to me, Tino, that even though I, I, I agree with what Jason has said within the limits of the argument, our allies in the East Asian region don't seem to be as enthusiastic about IPEF for all the reasons that Jason alluded to that there's no market access, doesn't address tariffs, and so on and so forth. So will the politics, if there is a second Biden term in the United States and in the Democratic Party, allow for revisiting uh, a, a return to TPP, even if it means negotiating uh, you know, the agreement again in some parts uh, to, make it more to make it more palatable? Let me slightly reframe your question and answer this way. Uh, can I imagine that under uh, a new administration, eventually Republican or Democratic, it might take a while, there will be an appreciation that one, the geopolitical goals the U.S. has to remain deeply relevant in the region are best served by some degree of market access, and two, that the IPEF goals around tech harmonization and standard setting are best served by also coupling that with some degree of economic integration, not just trade, but some degree of investment flow. Absolutely, I can see that. I mean, I, I feel like you're hearing my optimism about the US medium to long term, which is medium to long term at the end of the day, what this country is often about is reconciling divergent goals and trying to tie them together, whether it's promoting human dignity, as well as economic growth, as well as climate resilience, as well as national security and US interests, or some other permutation. And I think people will realize that if we take certain elements of that policy toolkit completely off the table, or fail to realize that we can keep those toolkits on the table, but also have to do some things domestically to redistribute income, hopefully in ways that don't really cut into efficiency and innovation, then US interests will not be served. That is a very hopeful uh, note on which to end. And I would, just, I would just add that it may actually be indispensable. Our ability to reconcile these tensions will be indispensable if we are to succeed uh, in the Indo-Pacific space in the face of China. So let me end by first thanking all three of you for taking the time to join me in this conversation. This is a subject that I suspect we will return to ag again because of its importance. And I, I personally profited from your insights and our audience almost certainly did too as well.
So thank you very much. I look forward to having you back here at Carnegie at some other point. Thank you, Ashley. Thank you, Ashley. Thank you. Thanks for the great discussion. Bye-bye. Thank you.